So uh, again, I'm Susan Bauer Wu, and I'm um, pleased to welcome you to Inspiring Minds, our, our new series. And um, we have three fabulous guests here today, Sharon Salzberg, Ruth King, Stephen Nachmanovich, and our host, Shankri Goldstein, will give them a full and proper introduction. Shankri is our host for Inspiring Minds. She is a program manager at Mind and Life. She is an, um, an active um, social justice activist, as well as a yoga teacher. And Shankri brings great warmth and just commitment to our values to do good in the world. So welcome Shankri. Thanks Susan. Grateful for this opportunity to be with you all and, and thank you all for, for hanging in there as we move through these technical glitches as I was speaking about earlier. So I'm so grateful uh, for this opportunity to participate in this unique and courageous conversation. And for this first episode entitled Mindful and Racial Healing, as, as Susan shared, uh, we have three incredible guests. So I'd like to do some brief introductions. Ruth King is joining us and she's the founder of Mindful of Race Institute. She's a celebrated author. She's an educator, a meditation teacher. Ruth currently teaches the Mindful of Race program to leaders, teams, and organizations weaving mindfulness-based principles with an exploration of our racial conditioning, its impact, and our potential. She's the author of Mindful of Race, Transforming Racism from the Inside Out. Next, we have Sharon Salzberg. She's a meditation pioneer and an industry leader, a world-renowned teacher and best-selling author. As one of the first to bring meditation and mindfulness into mainstream American culture over 45 years ago, her relatable approach has inspired generations of meditation teachers, wellness influencers. Sharon's most recent book is Real Change, Mindfulness to Heal Ourselves and the World. We will open our episode with a contemplative arts offering from Stephen Nakmanovich. Dr. Stephen Nakmanovich performs and teaches internationally as an improvisational violinist and at the intersections of multimedia, performing arts, humanities, ecology, and philosophy. He's the author of two books on the creative process, The Art of Is and Free Play. So without further ado, I'd like to bring Stephen up for his art performance. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much to Susan Bauer Wu and all of her partners in the Mind and Life Institute. Um, Shankari mentioned my book, The Art of Is. I wouldn't have begun this episode in this way if we didn't have a technical glitch, uh, but um, to be an improviser, which means to be a human being, uh, is to deal with what is. We is in a world where we're dependent on technology that is full of interesting little technical bloopers and bleepers. Um, we might choose to live in a world that's free of racial prejudice and hatred, but we don't live in that world. We might choose to live in a world that is free of ecological devastation and of the effects of human ignorance on the possibility of our children and grandchildren having a civilization. But we do live in this world. As an improviser, I play with the sounds that are around me. If I'm playing with other people, I have no score, I have no plan. So listening is the score, paying attention with all of your senses to who is around you and what is happening around you is the score. And even when you're playing alone, you are surrounded by invisible companions, human, non-human, living and dead. And we play in that surrounding. We play in the languages that we've known. We play in the setting of this world, which is imperfect. Impermanent.
You don't have to be a musician or a Buddhist to know that listening is the royal road to understanding other human beings. You don't have to be a Buddhist to know that the three poisons are greed, hate, and ignorance. <laughs> In the Buddhist tradition, Avalokiteshvara is the bodhisattva of great compassion. And that name means listening. It means literally hearing the cries of the world. Thank you.
Thank you so much. That was really, really beautiful. Um, and actually, it reminded me, listening to you, Stephen, of a conversation I had recently with somebody where they asked me what security meant, what, you know, how I would how I would define security. And I said, being able to meet the unexpected. And I think that that was that was very resonant for me in, in your work. So it also reminded me of my own practice, which I'd like to lead us in, you know, just a very short meditation together. Um, there's uh, what I see in myself in these days in our times that in order to have perspective or regain perspective once I've lost it and in order to have a vision of possibility, even in order to have some more courage, I need to have that sense of centeredness, some sense of groundedness and some sense of rest. And with that foundation, I can, I can build many things. So I just want us to do a very foundational exercise in meditation where we sit together and use the breath as an object to rest. So uh, if you want to sit comfortably, just close your eyes or not, however you feel most at ease. See if you can find the place where the breath is clearest for you or strongest for you. Maybe that's the nostrils or the chest or the abdomen. Bring your attention there and just rest. See if you can feel one breath without concern for what's already gone by, without leaning forward for even the very next breath, just this one. When I describe my earliest meditation practice, and this was the first instruction I ever got, just sit and feel your breath. I'd say that I, as some, almost as soon as this breath was beginning, I'd be leaning forward mentally to get ready for the next 50. I was very frightened. I was very wary. I didn't know what might happen next. A lot had already happened to me in my life and I was very hypervigilant. So for balance sake, I used to say to myself, settle back. Let the breath come to you. I'd also say you're breathing anyway. All you need to do is feel it. Settle back. Let the breath come to you, rest. And the sounds or images or Emotions or sensations come. If they're not very strong, if you can stay connected to the breath, just let them flow on by. Here is space. They can come and go. You don't have to follow them. You don't have to fight them. But if something is really strong and it just picks you up and whirls you away, you get lost in thought or spun out in a fantasy or you fall asleep, truly don't worry about it. We say the most important moment is the next moment after you've been gone, after you've been lost. Where we practice letting go and we practice beginning again. Just bring your attention back to the feeling of the breath. No blame. You don't have to add a sense of failure. We let go and we start over.
When you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the meditation. Thank you, Sharon. <clears throat> Thank you, Stephen, too. That was both practices, a beautiful way to ground and come into this space. So I'm gonna begin a conversation between uh, Ruth and Sharon. So my first question is for both of you, actually. Uh, I'll start with Ruth. We're clearly in a catalyzing time where we're being asked to meet the unexpected, as Sharon just shared with us. So for Ruth, what has been one transformational moment that you've experienced in these challenging times? And what did you learn? Well, it's hard to narrow it down to one, but um, just to first acknowledge a sense of gratitude for being with all of us here um, in an atmosphere of, of true um, blessedness as well as chaos in the world. And uh, one of the things I've learned, I guess that would be pivotal, would be that um, the practice works, the practice of steadying the mind and the heart actually it works for me days in a sense of retrospect. I find myself looking back on a situation that was upsetting and saying that my mind would, is what it used to be. And so this kind of, I think Joseph Goldstein refers to this momentum of mindfulness that is actually creating for me an atmosphere that supports a sense of stability and uh, kind heartedness, ability to soften more readily in distressing times. And I, I think I'm appreciating that I've got that kind of, um, that's got my back in a way as I move through these challenging times that are, you know, tossing around from time to time, but not being able to control everything that's happening. Um, and the reminder that how I might be seeing it just may not be totally, but rest back in the sense of um, allowing and accepting uh, and appreciating that I've invested in a way that it now holds me with a lot of care um, and supports me through these challenging times. Thanks, Ruth. So I just want, want you to know, Ruth, that your signal is just a, a little um, delayed. So in, in, the, in the absence of challenging times and acceptance, uh, I just want you to be aware of that, that I may ask you to repeat something if, if we miss something really good from you, but we are getting some comments in the, in the chat that you're breaking up a little bit. So yeah, I just wanted you to know that, but thank you for that sharing. Um, so same question for you, Sharon. What has been one transformational moment that you've experienced in these challenging times? And what have you learned? Mm -hmm. um, I would certainly uh, both celebrate and support everything Ruth just said, that my own practice, um, my own personal practice has been this tremendous support. And uh, when I first knew you were going to ask me this question, I actually did think of a moment uh, because practice is both uh, the inner work that we do and in, in cultivating certain skills, certain strengths. And it's also relational in terms of how we are with one another. So I spent the month of February in California, which I always like to talk about because it's like I went somewhere, you know, I was somewhere else. So I took an epic journey somewhere. And I got back to New York City, which is where I am now. Um, just in the beginning of March and uh, did some teaching and uh, there was a tremendous amount of anxiety here and um, the groups I was teaching were very large and it felt weird, but I, you know, no one knew quite why. And there was one um, place I was teaching, which is the last place I taught before I decided to go to my home in Massachusetts. Um, and the format of that place was that the presenter, the speaker, sits in the audience, the audience. and is formally introduced. And then they 
get up on the stage. So I was sitting next to somebody in the audience who was massively anxious. And, you know, she's, I didn't know if I should come and, you know, like, uh, but I'm here and maybe it was a mistake and, you know, because nobody quite knew really. And so um, I said, well, you know, you could talk about using the breath as a meditation. And, you know, often people find that centers and, you know, does these physiological things. And that wasn't interesting to her. So then I said, well, there's loving kindness meditation, which is another whole method, which will really, you know, it's expansive and it, it uh, does all these things. And that wasn't interesting to her either. So then I just looked at her and I said, is there anyone you can help? And she lit up and she got like completely radiant. And she said, well, you know, I have this elderly neighbor and maybe I can slip a note into her door and, and uh, ask her, can I help her with shopping or something like that? And it was like all of that kind of random energy of the anxiety had a channel. And, and that was actually a transformational moment for me where I thought, oh, remember that aspect, you know, never forget that too. Thank you for acknowledging that human connection. I think many of us are missing that in these times. It's, um, it's wonderful to, to talk about just connecting uh, with people and, and, and wanting to help them and checking in in a different way than just a generic question, you know, really asking what you can do for them. So um, my first question for Ruth about her book, uh, you released Mindful of Race, Transforming Racism from the Inside Out in, in 2018. And Sharon, your book, Real Change, just came out. And I've been reading both of them over uh, the course of this month to get ready for this conversation with both of you. Um, so for both of you, uh, Ruth, to start, what does it feel like to birth projects that discuss transforming unjust systems? And what does it look like to be on the front lines of human suffering? Thanks a lot to the question. And I... I think about the books, um, the book subtitle being Transforming Racism from the Inside. And that um, is, is, is important in, in, from where I sit from, uh, that's kind of a, a lot of energy around um, how we jump out and do something. And I don't want that to change by the way. But what I do want uh, is to enter, to bring a sense of understanding of our racial conditioning to the, uh, to the, to the mix, to bring an understanding of root, how we've been shaped. We've all been conditioned. Um, my book is centering race and racism. And we've all been shaped around that, whether we understand that or not. Um, and the opportunity we have is to investigate and interrupt half of harm. And for many folks, it's hard to do that if um, race doesn't tend to come up as an issue. Like in your meditation practice, if a stimulus is like it doesn't get investigated. Uh, and for others of us, race comes up all the time when we're doing this practice. And um, it's important that we in, we get educated around um, issues of race and racism, particularly in terms of how we've been conditioned on what is it about our um, racial inheritance that has been ungrieved and unrecognized uh, that needs our attention because I believe every generation is challenged with uh, elevating the tribe, elevate, elevating the consciousness to a different level, transcending, uh, bringing a sense of, of alchemy to the mix uh, when we start to look at our conditioning and acts of harm. Um, I, I think what's important to understand around race and racism is to embrace it fully, that we're all, we're all good individuals and we're also part of racial groups and that collective racial dynamic has impact in the world. And as we're investigating um, a sense of our conditioning, how we've been shaped to enter into uh, understanding of race and racism, 
it's important to hold some, some principles around that. The principle, for example, of interdependence connected. I think this pandemic that we're in is really amplifying an understanding of how the hip bone is connected to the leg bone and the right arm connected to the elbow. You know, there's there's just no way to to work this without an understanding um, that we have impact. That's a fundamental nature of reality that we need to keep in mind as we're looking at race and racism. That, that there, that's over there. That, but it's it's about our interdependence. And another core principle has to do with the only harm. Imagine just moving through your day, um, reminding yourself with regularity to do no harm, to do no to yourself, do no harm to others, to, and to really see the subtle gradations of how we impulsively um, can do that from our conditioning, from innocence, from our so just having that be a practice, remembering that we are connected, um, having a non-negotiable, um, non-harming. And the third thing that I think is so crucial in the mix uh, that we need to remember when we are starting to best been shaped and formed to be in relationship with race and racism has to do with kindness, kindness as a weapon of mass healing that can't form race and race without the heart being intimately involved. That race and racism is about the heart. It's about a division of heart, a, a division of heart that lives in mind that influences our actions knowingly or unknowingly. Mm -hmm. So these are these are things in the like the fact way of entering into this engagement. And I think the other piece to this, and I think Sharon just spoke to that, do the relational field, that our awareness around race and racism is amplified when we're in community. And there's some dynamic around community that we need to be sensitive to, which we can talk about a little later. But I think it's the rubbing, it's the body to body that echoes and reflects back to us our conditioning. Sometimes um, this, is, this is kind of the mirroring we need in terms of our impact. So maybe I'll just leave it there for now just to, just to offer us that these are some of the ways I'm putting um, sacred energy of uh, what's possible when we can dissolve the heartbreak and heartburn and pain patterns of race and racism. It begins on the inside and it has a profound impact on our well-being and, and our collective well-being. Thank you for touching on collective community care. And I think Sharon was speaking to that as well in her, in her first response and the kindness with, with other people. Sharon, is there anything that you wanted to add in terms of what, it's, what does it look like right now to be on the front lines of human suffering and to work with other activists in this moment? We talked about that in our early conversation um, before this episode. Um, well, I, I mean, I think that in a way I've always worked with activists and that, you know, so much of my um, teaching, especially in recent years, has been more with what we might call caregivers, international humanitarian aid workers, or people who are really on the front lines of suffering, as well as people who are maybe taking care of a parent or a sibling or something like that, you know? And so um, what came up in my mind actually listening to, to Ruth was, was uh, something a little bit different, which was, uh, because I also teach just in general, whoever appears, you know, and what I've seen for so many years is that I really do believe that meditation practice for the most part, not for everyone, you know, I'm sure, but for the most part, we'll really develop a kinder heart and, and much more compassion. But what might be 
another step that isn't always there by any means is a kind of view of systems change. So the example I usually give is I've had, I don't know how many students come to me and say, um, I started meditating and then I was taking a walk and somebody on the street asked me for a dollar. And I gave them a dollar because that's my habit. That's my practice to give, give them money. But this is the first time I ever looked that person in the eye and realized that was a human being. And, and that is really, a, I think, a, an unfolding of, of a greater wisdom, a sense of interconnection, a, a way of paying attention that's different. And that what may be missing is then I say, I don't know if that person then goes on to say ever, I wonder what the housing policy is in my city so that there's so many people on the street. Um, I was talking to David Desteno from Northeastern University and who did that study where the last part of the study was in the waiting room of the lab where he hired many actors. And the question was who got up to offer their chair to the next actor who walked in who was on crutches and looked like they were in terrible pain. And was it the meditator or the non-meditator who got up to offer their chair? And he found some vast amount more meditators than non-meditators got up. So my question to him was, did anybody ever ask why there were so few chairs? You know, where's the lab spending its resources? There's a kind of education or way of looking at things, um, looking more deeply at causes and conditions, which I think would serve us as we try to make a difference. It's always a balance because there is the immediate situation. There's the assumption we're making about somebody that might be unjust. And so we need to really change our own way of thinking, or, or there may be um, the person, you know, who seems ill at ease or, or whatever it is. And then, and then there's the system. Sharon, why do you think it's important to understand the structure of the mind and its conditioning? And how is racism's human capital system a projection of that conditioning? Because you both just talked about systems and conditioning. So how does the mind come into the, to that? Uh, some of it, I think, is is sort of the um, lack of what Ruth was talking about, the awareness of interconnection. Like, I was talking to a, a physician not too long ago, head of a large medical practice at a hospital, who said to me, you know who I'm appreciative of in a way I never was before is the cleaning staff. And I thought, well, yeah, you know, like, if I'm a surgeon, I would really want like that uh, theater, <laughs> that operating theater to be sterile or uh, the way, you know, the people we normally discount and look through, often people of color, you know, the grocery store clerk or uh, the person serving our food. And, and uh, we, we don't necessarily stop for a moment and say, this is a person you know, who has hopes and dreams and aspirations and challenges and wants to be happy just like I do. And we tend to look through them or objectify them. And so what happens when we look at them is the question. And what I'm really fascinated by uh, in terms of this discussion is assumptions. You know, the, the assumptions we make about someone else uh, based on some story, you know, not based on who they are. And it comes up quickly and, and the challenge is, you know, can our awareness, can our mindfulness be as quick so that we see, I'm assuming that person doesn't belong here. I'm assuming that person um, is doing that job because they can't do anything else. Or I'm assuming whatever it might be. And uh, to, to one, and so one of my like kind of personal goals is to have my mindfulness be fast enough so that I can just see those assumptions. Did you want to add anything to that, Ruth? Yeah, I do. Um, especially as it relates to race and racism. Um, I think there's some dynamics that we can begin to recognize that speak to um, and when we understand that patterning that the collective wave actually lives in our social realm um, 
then it, it starts to take on um, a, a mightier understanding, I think. We can look at individual interactions and um, making sure we keep the humanity in, in the front of our heart and mind. But also the gestalt of um, how race plays. There is a dominant and subordinated racial dynamic in our social realm. This pattern trained the mind and heart to see. It's not looking at individuals, it's looking at collective dynamics. Because uh, our actions collectively have impact and they are a reflection of mind, right? So, um, you know, I, I, I've been reading Isabel's book about past, and I feel like she talks similarly to how I talk about dominant and subordination of racial hierarchy. The ways I played with something she said was that there is a social hierarchy where races are ranked based on value and usage. And uh, this is an important thing to see as a, as a swarm of activity in our social realm, as an inflammation that we see, for example, in the political system. Um, and, and in a way to drop this awareness into our investigation practice, practice. And often I ask the people that I work with to look at why are matters of race and racism so matter of concern that have to do with me? It's that what does it have to do with me part that I'm most concerned about because I report out and we're not touching um, the reality of how it lives in our own hearts and minds. The, the, the best that we're in, so to speak, in our political realm and social realm right now is, is a reflection of heart and mind. It's a reflection of consciousness of that we're planting and how we are in relationship to what's happening right now are also seeds that are planted that will bloom. We need to be educated on how to look. So I'm happy to see that perception came up because perception is shaped around our conditioning. It's usually something related to the past that we layer on top, on top of the present. And then we're off and running as if it's a, a real thing. Uh, and so how do we interrupt? How do we interrupt our perceptions? I remember, um, being in Charlottesville, I've done a bit of work there uh, with the Insight community on my race. And early when I was there, I went to, uh, after a training, someone was driving me to the airport and we stopped at this section. And at the section, I looked up and it said Barack Avenue, right? And all of a sudden I was so excited. It was like I got hot and I I sat up straight and I felt like I was speaking in Swahili. I had a whole story about, wow, look at what a progressive city this is. All of this is going to happen. And then I bothered to open my mouth to ask the woman driving the car. And what I said was, wow, what an amazing, what a progressive city you have here. Barack Avenue. And she cleared her throat and said, well, in these parts, we call it Barracks Avenue. But I was so convinced was that it literally had me on a whole momentum of conviction and story and, um, and beliefs used all moved for the whole bit, only to open my mouth, luckily, because sometimes we don't open our mouths, we just keep going with our beliefs, right? In my mind, I get a chance, we giggle for, to the rest, you know, all the way to the airport. But just this conviction you can have about a view and perception, this same conviction is what, how some people pull a trigger and how some races are seen as, you know, criminals and others are not. I mean, the same mechanism work around their perceptions, which is really driven by how we've been conditioned to be in relationship at a personal level, 
with race and racism. So to slow that down, which is the beauty of what a mindfulness practice can offer, us to back, drop in and see what the body is doing in relationship to the stimuli interacting with. If we can drop this into our practice, then we have something to investigate. But if we're not educated around our race, how we turn away, shut down, don't see all these dynamics, uh, then we don't, um, we, don't, we don't have what we need to get. It's just a concept or it stays at the individual level. And my interest is highly in how we bump up to see collective dynamics, recognize ourselves in it, and interrupt the habits of harm. And by the way, bring some folks with you when you're doing that. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. So I would, that's what I would add to the very important piece. You're making me thinking, uh, think of something I learned when I was writing uh, my book or I learned more about was um, attribution bias, you know, which, um, you know, uh, is something like, you know, if somebody that you consider one of your kind, you know, or uh, in right. terms of self and other or us and them, somebody who's part of us messes up and does something wrong, then you think, well, they got you know overwhelmed by the bad crowd they're running around with, or it was inevitable because there was some circumstance, you know? So it's not about like who they are essentially as a person, it's about the way conditions brought them there. But if somebody from the other group or tribe does the same thing, then you think, oh, well, they're like a bad kid, you know? They're essentially bad. It's not about conditions. It's about some uh, irredeemable character trait. And so again, it's just the play of our minds, the story that we tell. That play of our minds, and it's also a social conditioning because a lot of that dynamic of, of the young kid that's doing bad, that's, there's a racial strategy that. A lot of black and brown bodies are impacted by that collective social norm. And white bodies are kind of innocent around how that might play. So it looks individual. Um, I think we're conditioned as a human race, often conditioned to individual lens. Uh, and people of color are conditioned to work around issues of the collectives. And so our story and the way we talk about them, um, you know, we miss each other when we're in the conversation because what people of color are bringing are the collective historic cumulative impact of, of the weight of trying to point this out. And, and people, white people enter off with um, and, and, and well-meaning and, um, you know, there, there's nothing wrong. It's just that the, the history of whiteness is not always tender conversation. So our hearts don't connect. And I think that's a missed opportunity uh, and a right opportunity to consider how we enter into engaging. So people say, well, why can't we just all get in a room and figure it out? Well, we can not all get in a room because we bring different things. And then some people, a lot of brown bodies end up carrying the weight of their own traumas as well as educating people. And then other people end up uncomfortable because this is all being pointed out. And so there's a series and accumulation of of, of ways we end our heart and minds in the midst of that. So I, I, this is one reason why I think we need to be in racial affinity groups to fortify our understanding of our community from a mindfulness sense so that we can rest the heart and open it enough to be able to engage around the heart chronic fatigue, judicial pain of this issue in a very intentional and and to the degree possible safe, sacred space. Ruth, you just brought up one of the six, two of the six hindrances that you speak to in your book on uh, to racial harmony. 
Can you share a little bit more about those characteristics, particularly focusing on intent and impact and cumulative impact? And then maybe just to follow up, you can tie in the intergenerational trauma and, and how we begin to heal from, you know, the through the black lens and through the white lens, maybe Sharon can chime in with that as well, how we begin to heal some of this intergenerational mm -hmm. trauma. Yeah, thank you. Um, the um, hindrances that I talk about in the book are, uh, there's these six hindrances that, um, that show, show how the dominant and subordinated racial dynamics play out. So there's some observable things we can train the heart to see. And um, one of the ones I like to start with that I think sets up intent and impact well has to do with this and the combination. So it has to do with what we're trained to perceive. So I tell the story often of um, in 2014, when Michael Brown Jr. was killed by a uh, 28-year-old Daryl Wilson, right, in Ferguson, Missouri. We, we know of this, many of us know of this story. So I was in a group of people together talking about um, what happened, and they showed the clip. And there was a few people in the circle, and a white in the circle that was in. He's, after watching the video, he said, I can't believe that that guy shot that boy and that should have never happened. He was trembling. He was upset. He saw the star. When I shared about the story, what I talked about was I can't believe that once again, an unarmed Black man has been killed by a white police officer. I saw a constellation. I saw color. I saw the Big Dipper. <laughs> And this is this is when when um, when we try to talk about race, we were both distraught. Our hearts were both broken, but our eyes were trained to see different things, right? So that's an example of stories and constellation and intent. The intent in that situation was very showed up at that meeting for conversation to to open our hearts, to, to talk about what could be done. Um, so our intent was good, the impact, the impact on me from the innocence was the invisibility of color. Uh, so, so, so here we are, the intent has this, what happens collectively with intent and impact, especially for black indigenous and people of color is often the impact situations like that. We, we call them microaggressions. There's been many words over the generations that refer to it. What happened uh, impact for Black, Indigenous, and people of color? The cumulative impact is coming from the perpetual state of pointing it out or working with that is collapsed in all of those situations. So we end up being in situations where often where we have to manage our own stimulation mission to try to talk about it. And by the way, needing to talk about it in a way that we're not upsetting the other person and then dealing with the defense. Well, that's what I meant. Let me explain what I meant. All of this is just messy at best. It's our attempt to try to come together, but these are the things and out that often into. So, it's, it's, it's the reason why I think we need spaces where we can get more fortified and clear into our habits, our reactivity, um, and uh, investigate that and understand that the truth of it and uh, a support, a sense of stability, clear seeing, you know, um, staying present to we run into, we need places where we can develop that. We can't always just get in a place and hash it out because there's a burden that happens in the animated dance. And that's some of the ways that it looks. Now, one of the ways that I try to work with that is through the work of um, uh, group development work where we are working with our own people 
in investigating our racial conditioning and understanding some of the same races as well as the complexity and the ways we've been shaped that influence how we're in relationship to each other and races. And throughout this year long program, there's times when groups, the people are working within their own racial affinity groups. And then other times when we come together as a larger cohort to leverage the lens of our heart. But I think we need places where we can do that. Otherwise, I think the burden is always on people and black folks, indigenous folks to educate white folks when this is something I feel like that can happen, they, that could, they could be doing that. We could all be doing levels. I just think it's important, it's a, it's a prime place for our mindfulness practice to be using our practice this way to investigate our position. And the Buddha specialized in suffering. And I don't know of any greater suffering right now than what's happening and how we learn how to strengthen our city. Their witness, clear seeing, um, and again, keeping the fact that we're interdependent, keeping a harm out of the mix, and the power of um, a compassionate heart. Um, this is a life's work. This is not um, a quick minute practice that's a good use of our mindfulness. Thank you, Ruth. Sharon, would you like to add on to that? And then we'll probably begin to wrap it up and, and move on to public Q&A after that. All right. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, beautifully said, first of all, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have this memory, I'm not sure if it's the last time Ruth and I were together physically, but in Charlotte as a Democratic National Convention in, uh, yeah. in 2012. Uh, so when you said that about Charlottesville and, and the city, I just, remembered us walking down the streets together. And uh, in a way, how much hope was in the air, you know, and uh, you know, how, how difficult, difficult things are. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think that uh, people are at all kinds of different levels of understanding, you know, um, and uh, to be supported and growing because the point is change you know the point is creating a better world and 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 that means change and so uh to have a kind of um learning environment whatever that looks like you know so that uh that can really happen seems to be the most important thing and i was remembering you know even um uh, something I've written about often is uh, the stories that people tell about us and how we can absorb them and then sort of become them. And, you know, and I know that obviously not as a person of color, you know, but as myself. And I, I remember teaching somewhere I was in Kentucky and, and somebody said, I don't, I don't get that. I don't buy that. You know, like, how can people tell a story about us if they don't know us? They're not telling a story about us. And and I just said, everything tells the story about us. Architecture tells the story about us. Do you belong or, you know, do you in the wheelchair have to go like, you know, three blocks out of the way, you know, to get in or something like that. Everything actually is telling a story about us. And, and I think for people even to start there and to have some, some understanding of that and to realize it is a profound story too, because there is the question of intergenerational trauma and, uh, you know, it's not just a personal story. And so I think that that's like a good note to, to really emphasize. Thank you for that, Sharon. So I want to invite Stephen to come back in and, and keep this conversation going, but allow participants to come in and ask you some questions. Um, we have plenty of questions in the chat. And I want to uh, invite uh, Rabia, Rabia, I hope I'm saying your name correct, to raise her hand. She has a question and she would like to come on and ask it live. So as we move through these tech, so she has raised her hand. My life. Yes. And you are live. Thank you. 
Thank you both, Sharon and Ruth, for your wonderful teachings. Um, I am part of a spiritual community, a Sufi community, and we love unity and uh, divinity and oneness. And so my question is, how can we help bridge the tendency of spiritual workers to transcend challenges um, and bring them to look at the root of the challenges, racism, the ecological crisis, and transform them rather than transcend them. Mm -hmm. And Stephen, please feel free to answer too yeah. if you feel called. Well, transforming means you are part of the story. Uh, it's very easy to um, sort of have a bird's eye view of the culture that we're in. And um, if you're lucky enough to be in a pleasant situation where you have enough to eat and where you have housing and everything else, uh, it's possible to talk about transcending. Uh, but um, to realize that no matter what our conditions, we are part of the story and that it's an interaction, it's an intersection among ourselves, all of ourselves. That's not easy sometimes because it causes us to have to revisit who we are and to participate perhaps in things that uh, we're not very comfortable in. Did you want to add anything, Sharon and Ruth? I'll say uh, sometimes I think that I know for a lot of the work that I'm what I my first with people, especially people that I care for, that I'm I don't want you to I don't want that to sound like I don't care for people that I'm that I'm in community with and, and have a regular relationship with is I find myself in situations where I'm asking consent around about dot, 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 whatever the question might be, whatever the concern might be okay with you. Do I have your permission? Are you willing to engage me around this? Um, so that they are willing to be uh, engaging with you. Um, sometimes I think it, th these are these might be some basic su suggestions. But with the book club with people where you're reading something that's well written and then you're talking about it and you're discussing it and you're looking at the relevance of that you and what what you're trying what you're trying to do. And I was reminded when you talked about transcendence versus what was your um, microphone kind of broke up, Ruth. I think it breaks up just a little when you move. You're like me, you're an animated speaker. I move my body and my hands. So was it transcendence and transformation? Yes, participating in the story. Yeah, I was I was thinking specifically to the words that were we'll used. Yeah. Um, yeah. Transformation. And, and now I've kind of lost yeah. Yeah, my that. Um, but, I, but I think some very basic things of asking consent, is, especially if you're talking about um, to say, hey, let's talk about this. I want to talk about this. This is important to me. Can we sit and talk about it? Are to do that? Now, there are situations where you don't have that kind of luxury. You just have to say some things. But in terms of that relational field, building community on this issue, um, I think we need to really set the tone of saying, there, can we talk about this together? 
And I think there's several conversations that may happen at the same time, you know, because um, like, I don't necessarily use the word divine being from a Buddhist tradition, you know, but if that vision is like, there's the divine in everyone and we're going to just see the divine in everyone when you meet, when you say oneness, um, that doesn't uh, mean that this other conversation shouldn't also happen. You know, they kind of both have to happen in a way. Like I was thinking about, um, you know, my goddaughter uh, was born in China and adopted by her, her American parents brought here. And she was in a movie when she was a very little girl. There was some movie about like a family um, reunion and you know, but she didn't say anything, but she was there in the movie. And so she was a member of the family and she was the only Asian appearing child in, in the movie. And one of the conditions of her mother for her to be allowed to be in the movie was that it not be mentioned that she was adopted that this is what families can look like sometimes. This is what they look like, you know? And here it is, you know? And uh, so in a way that's like saying, let's see the divine in everyone. This is what a family can look like. Well, the first time, maybe the only time I saw um, Grey's Anatomy uh, and Shonda Rhimes had, you know, the head of the hospital who was like a neurosurgeon, he was black and nobody ever mentioned that. It was just like, this is what a professional staff can look like. You know, and here it is. And, and I appreciated that. And I appreciate the fact that there's another conversation that also has to happen. You know, like what was, what did that man go through, you know, to like get to be that in that position? It's not what maybe a white person would have gone through at all, you know? And so uh, I don't think we need to discard the other, but we need to have this one right now. And I just um, want to acknowledge that we're a little over time just because of the technical difficulties that we had at the beginning, but we're going to keep the Q&A going for another 10 minutes, if that's okay. Um, we do have a question coming in from Cami, so maybe she can raise her hand now and ask her question. Did you raise your hand, Cami? Hi, there it goes. Sorry, I had a hard time unmuting myself. So um, thanks for the opportunity to ask a question. My question is um, sort of nuts and bolts related. Um, we're in the early stages of building a, a racial affinity group at my institution. And some of us are, um, are feeling sort of restless by the prospect of doing this very, what feels internally social work, self-reflective internal work and feel pulled by the demands of the time and wanna be acting or at least have a plan for action at the end of this group, whenever that might be. And I'm wondering if, um, especially you, Ruth, could speak to the balance between slowing down and paying attention and just observing, training those habits of mind and this feeling that we need to be acting and making a plan. Yeah, <laughs> that's a really good question that I appreciate. And, um, you know, I mean, I think both need to happen. There needs to be action concurrent with an investigation of, of what you bring to the act that you're planting. What is this action um, really, uh, uh, how, how much, how conscious can we be about um, running away from something or towards something, rather avoiding um, the, uh, the what can feel really as we close to this topic, um, the ways that we flee. I think uh, time is one of the pillars of privilege when we all have the same amount of time. It's kind of like race is is often kind of uh, subordinated in the in the scope of things to be to be done. So, uh, and this introspection is is not. You know, we don't we don't run to towards discomfort or the perception that we may be uh, uncomfortable easily. 
So it really requires a certain commitment. This is a particular, if, if you're following the framework in my book, it's very bright um, and uh, inviting a lot of intentionality around the work. You're gonna give it some time. You're gonna save your questions. You're gonna use your practice to uh, support yourself. And it's, and it's a commitment. So I, I would just invite an investigation of the urgency to do something or to feel you must do something when you've committed to looking at this, this kind of inquiry. Um, and just, it's just like in mindfulness, you know, you catch yourself uh, feeling that anxiety, wanting to do something, there's a lot to, that needs to be done. And then you make that yourself back to this practice for now is just really taking a dive into our conditioning, looking at how we understand each other in this intimate way, understanding whiteness, right? This is our commitment for now. Um, yeah, and you just return. Be caring in terms of that impulse, that conditioned impulse to kind of slide into action. You know, historically, there's always been money and, and on this issue around race. Uh, we we really want to look at how our what what seeds we're planting when we move into action. Uh, so grounded, it's well seeded, uh, it's well intended when we do take action, and we understand ourselves in the. We know our part. We know what we bring, and we know what we can offer to not just do an action, but to uproot the perpetuation of, of the situation. So those are some thoughts I, I have here. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm putting it. All right. We have a question from Kevin Rudin. Kevin, did you want to come up and ask your question? Otherwise, I can ask it. There you go. Sure. Hey. Um, thank you, Shantari. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm just been spending time lately reflecting on what I guess I'm kind of thinking about is like the contemplative lens, the ethical philosophical foundations, cultural foundations within which these contemplative practices evolved and were developed and were really intended to be practiced within. And there's this foundation of support. And so I think about things as y'all have been talking about interconnectedness and all this. And I feel like in a lot of ways, these practices might sort of presuppose um, a certain familiarity with these ideas are like an attending to them in our daily lives that might not always immediately um, be as present for say a Western participant in a traditional MBSR program or something. And so I wonder what is I guess lost or in that extraction from a cultural context, but also just like what's the interplay between the contemplative practices themselves and this sort of contemplative lens that, and maybe how can we do better at focusing on that lens piece in our secular uh, application of these things? Um, there's a, uh, there's this huge interaction between culture and spiritual practice. And uh, the Buddhist practices that originated in India and spread to China, spread to Japan, spread to Depet, spread to the West, um, have kept changing and morphing through all these transformations, and yet they still uh, contain, um, you know, a deep rooting in those original cultures. Um, and they're going to keep changing, you know, if we manage to not uh, destroy human civilization in the next couple generations. One can only imagine 20 centuries from now, from now what further transformations there'll be. And um, I think it's also true in artistic traditions, uh, because looking at uh, Indian classical music, Western classical music, dance, 
uh, painting from the Middle Ages. Um, there's always something to be gained by uh, understanding the culture from which those practices arose. But there's also something to be gained from allowing them to be transplanted and allowing them to change and allowing ourselves to uh, be moved as 21st century modern people by all of this ancient stuff that came from a completely different context. You know, we have um, uh, in the United States, there's this huge uh, political brouhaha now about originalism. Shall we interpret the Constitution exactly the way that a couple dozen white men in the 1780s thought the Republic should be, or can we allow ourselves to evolve? Uh, if we can allow ourselves to evolve, then it's possible for a woman to become a Supreme Court justice. If we're going to stick to the way it was in 1787, a woman cannot be a Supreme Court justice. You know, the, uh, uh, the monastic practices of Buddhism in its original form uh, and its subsequent forms in China and Japan were largely practiced by men, though not entirely. And historically, uh, there have been women practitioners forever. Um, but um, today, we're living in a different time. And we're living in a time when the traditions are open to everyone. And that means the traditions will be somewhat different. And um, I don't think anyone is the authority on what extent, to what extent is the tradition itself as we change it, and to what extent is it a new thing, uh, just as uh, the DNA that we're composed of. Uh, it's both very, very new and it's three and a half billion years old. Thank you, Stephen. I think that about wraps up our time. We've gone over quite a, quite a bit. And um, I just want to give Ruth the opportunity to, to close us out. I, I hope that you all enjoyed this portion of the Q&A. So Ruth is going to lead us in a short meditation to close. Okay. Uh, thank, uh, and, um, thank everyone. Thank you for your, your heartful presence and um, for plugging in and um, just turn your attention inward again and um, returning to what Sharon offered us on breath, maybe just lowering your eyes and dropping your awareness in and down. And you just take a moment of gratitude as you soften with each breath, maybe resting on the exhale. Appreciating all the care that's here collecting us, all those who are not here. our good intentions. Appreciate the work and work that went into organizing us and making this work for us. generosity and all of the sharing. Taking a moment to know this warmth and gratitude on the inside. May we lead this time together. May we remember that we belong to each other. Mm -hmm.
may we understand that what we do can help or hinder racial well-being. And may our thoughts and actions reflect the world we want to live in and leave behind. May we feel the separation and hid from our ancestors in gratitude for this life. May all beings benefit from our growing awareness. May our, may our thoughts and action be ceremonies of well-being for all races of all humankind. And may we honor and being diverse with human rights. And may we meet the racial cries of the world with as much wisdom and grace we can muster. May we all be well and kind on the path. Thank you to all. Deep bows to Ruth to Sharon, to Stephen for giving us time today. And thank you to the Mind and Life team who worked behind the scenes with today's Inspiring Minds online event. And as we mentioned before in Susan's opening, we're gonna be gathering together again next month for the November Inspiring Minds episode. The date is November, Wednesday, November 18th. We're gonna be joined by Gail Parker, Richard Freeman, and a live performance by Peter Cantor, Cater, sorry. The theme will be yoga as a tool for social change, where, we'll, where we will explore how embodied yoga practices can lead to greater self-awareness and agency in contributing to a better world. So please be sure to register for that. Again, I wanna thank you all for joining us today. Please continue to stay connected to mind and life as we move forward in these challenging times. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Stephen, so much. Yeah. Thank you, Steve and Shankar.